about technicality. I will talk about why we need a lot of sophistication and technology uh, to make an impact and what this impact is from the designer's and architect's perspective relative to and versus the engineer's perspective. In the program, I've promised to talk about three, these three notions, the instrumentality of appearances, about information-rich environments, and finally, about the need for aesthetic revolutions. And we are going through one of those uh, right now. I just want to uh, click through a number of our facade, the envelopes, and building figures we've been creating, and you will see a variety of forms, patterns, materials, and just go through that without much comment, and we'll come back to some of those. So we have about completed about 60 buildings in the last well, 15 years, 20 years actually, the first one was completed. But we only got going the last few years properly. Some very recent works still in the finishing touches. This is the only rendering and not <laughs> building which I in this sequence. And this is one of the final yeah. touches of something perhaps most spectacular. Very precise. Yeah. So why are we doing all this? Uh, why do we have this variety, this complexity? Why are we putting you guys so hard to work? Is it just because we love it and we get away with it? Or is there some purpose to that? trying to answer that question in that lecture. So formalism, I mean, that's what we're accused of. This excessive adherence to prescribed form, that's kind of the dictionary uh, definition. Uh, but I think it's more about this, that a design is being accused of formalism if it is driven by a concern with forms and formal qualities supposedly for their own sake. And sometimes that's what's happening, but maybe there's a deeper intuitive uh, process which, has, which reveals some rationality if you reflect on it and try to theorize what might be the meaning of these wide variety of, and range of ex forms of expression which we're delivering through facades. So my definition of a formalism in a, as a positive concept is a little bit different. It's something which comes through when you have a formal compositional system, a language, a sort of principles, which give coherence and unity to something which could otherwise be quite complex. Yeah, within the, within the habit of that. So, yeah. and you can start that with yeah. formal play. You can, yeah, well, uh, and the arts yeah. have been feeding into design since the early 20th century in particular, and modern art well, is instrumental for modern architecture. So this is, of course, a, a project which is developed under the auspices of what I call a relentless formalism. And what does it mean? I mean, it brings everything under the, is forced into this kind of system while it's still delivering a lot of pragmatic um, performances. But I would start to argue that the expression of a unity and also of a difference and of a character is itself performative, and I call this social performance through communication. And so if you look at all our buildings, have this otherness and unity and coherence and internal var variation. Then you look from the exterior into the in-between and interiors, all the way to the details, 
like you saw in Maxi, all the elements, whether it's ribs, staircases, windows, they all follow a relentless formalism and yet I would argue they're delivering all the pragmatic performances required and more and that bit of more is what we actually concerned about. So functionalism is the doctrine that a design of an object should be determined solely by its functions rather by aesthetic considerations and when I grew up in architecture there was a stark contrast made between performance and representation. And so the slogan was performance versus representation. Representation should be kind of something kind of shallow and superficial. Um, and I'm inverting this, I would say, uh, performance through representation, social performance through representation. So, and that for me is important to demarcate the discipline of architecture, social versus technical functionality. And uh, I Presenting this as a polemic image, uh, this is from the Venice Biennale Rams Elements show. And you can see here architectural surfaces, and you can see that kind of thin layer of the ceiling, and that final millimeter is what actually we are in charge of as architects and designers, what we care about, um, how it envelopes, what it shapes the space and characterizes the space, and everything above and around, under the hood is your guys' business, engineering business, and ultimately we don't care. We get involved in all of this so that we make sure that this last millimeter is exactly what we want it to be. And I'm defending that concern only with surface, but surface is not superficial. Surface is very deep because it is structures and orders our interactions and characters and tells us where we are and who we might meet and what we're supposed to be doing. is all messaged in these final surfaces. And that's why we care deeply about those surfaces intuitively. And uh, this is the same when we dress up and we put makeup on. We deeply, deeply care <laughs> because it tells us who we are and what we project and what we are about. Um, so I'm calling this architecture societal function is the ordering of social processes. And that happens not by shoving and pushing physical bodies into various places, that's happens too to some extent, but it's more about our self-sorting according to the signals of these surfaces, according to the text that is the city. So the built environment's communicative capacity is incredibly important and becomes more and more important as we live in a very, very dynamic and open society in large cities where we all have to congregate, <laughs> self-sort and find each other in various relevant interaction scenarios. And we need that text, which is the city. We need that system. Now, we always we're dependent on that to create a social structure of cooperation where we, where we use the built environment and the way it signals and lays those various activities, the way thresholds are, are placed. And you can see that the, the morphologies which are coming out of construction, the, the different structures are different in appearance and they also create uh, global forms as they aggregate and uh, they obviously have various texture surface materialities but we need more, we need to put, yeah. so there's a kind of naturally evolved morphology and then it's not differentiating enough so we put that graphic layer on top and we need that for our built environment, we need it for ourselves as well and we all do it. I can see who is, a, who is more, on, who is an engineer, who is an architect, who is a designer, who is a banker, etc. So, yeah. <laughs> and so we dress ourselves up and we dress our environments up and this is not an excessive, unnecessary, exuberant um, investment. This is an absolute necessity because these characters, they are on the edge of poverty always already and the investment in this means something and those societies which didn't invest in all this decoration uh, didn't succeed because you find it in all human societies. There is no possibility of human society uh, without this. So we need it and we still need it and architecture is an essential part of that. <laughs> Differentiating the, the, society, the social body and making it intricate in its interactions and the build up of societal complexity. So that's the way we have to understand the cities and that's why we're investing heavily in this makeup, in this graphic overlay. And I want to systematize this and think about what's the overall image and sense because this 
is now a, an agglomeration of competing icons which do their work partially for each of them individually, but as a, as a collective venture, it's kind of self-defeating nearly. Because it's, it's getting kind of amorphous, uh, undecipherable mass. Um, but that's a diff different uh, lecture, perhaps. But I also want to point out that the modernists thought ornament was crime and tried to strip this bear. I disagree, and the, and the examples here was the primitives, the way they're over kind of graphic, uh, this, uh, build them, make themselves up into, into characters, but of course also the tattooing of criminals was Loos's reference, and he compared this to the, the ornamentation of architecture, and he wanted to strip it bare, and I think that was the outcome of that to some extent, but that is blinding dysfunction on a communicative level, so this was actually the crime. Ornament is a necessity, a life, um, a necessity, and, and to extinguish it is, is, here, is the crime, as far as I'm concerned, the crime of modernism. That's why modernism in the end was also, um, let's say, demolished. So we had then the slogan in postmodernism, architecture must speak again, and the way you're signaling the building form itself could signal its purpose in a bit of a superficial way, or you put big letters on it, and that both of these things happening to some extent. But I'm criticizing both of them uh, as, as false, and what I put in place of this is something I will talk at the end, is, I call it tectonism, it's a, it's a more sophisticated utilization of, of the morphologies that come out of the technical necessities and heighten them into a language. Just to summarize uh, what we've discussed so far, the most general description of architecture's task is to provide order rather than shelter. Shelter is a side product, it's, it's rather simple, but the ordering of social, social processes. Uh, so we are in charge of this, that means social functionality, and we do that mostly, we do that partly through physical demarcations, which are become real barriers. As more and more we do this through communicated de demarcations and distinctions, which we navigate freely. So we live in a free society of free interaction. So this leads to the validating the compositional stance where you kind of tweak the form and invest in the form and explore its expression. And I want to talk about the purpose of formal composition. And uh, we have, and one of the important things here is just to, to, if you have a complex building with multiple parts, how do you express its unity? which parts belong together and also how you differentiate them the parts. So you have uh, symmetry and proportion which comes out of technical requirements which give a kind of regularity and unity and then you also have the marking of the entrance in the, in the, in the center, etc. So it is a serious uh, uh, system of compositional regularity which gives unity and differentiation and, and, and uh, legibility to classical architectures. You also know where things are relative to each other, on axis, you can infer the back from the front, etc., etc. Here we have more degrees of freedom and it becomes more problematic, but what this shows that if as society differentiates, you have more parts which coming together into institutions. That's the Bauhaus. We have the, the apartment building in the front with its volume, depth, height, facade patterns. Then you have the uh, administrative block with the band windows, you have a workshop block in classrooms, you have a workshop block with a different volume and facade. So the risk here is that you, sh you express more, so it works on, a, on the level of differentiating different parts, but it becomes problematic and precarious with respect, do these parts all belong together? So how do you compose it in a way that there is still unity across the differences? And one of the things we're doing, uh, what the modernists had on, as a compositional repertoire, was dynamic equilibrium compositions. They allowed for asymmetry. That means they have more degrees of freedom to compose a complex institution. They gave up on symmetry and proportion. They could make these elements as long as they wanted. But they maintained something like this, the play of balancing the volumes. So here you have the three volumes. They, they, be, they kind of uh, balance in some kind of imagined dynamic equilibrium with a center of gravity. And this is also what students at the Bauhaus did, and what a painting like this is, there's a sense of balancing asymmetrically. This is a sketch of Mies, and he asked all the students at IIT at the time to, to build asymmetric compositions 
which balance out and indicate a center of gravity, let's say. So, uh, and this is this early brick house from 1923. The bar house is also this kind of pinwheel com composition where the different parts uh, uh, gravitate around the center of gravity. And you can see here the different parts, the way they're built. But you can see already here that this is also in danger of falling apart and fusing with other parts, so and you get lost in, in, in a kind of field of um, um, elements which don't configure anymore. And uh, also what becomes precarious and difficult, the unity of the overall object when you go around from the different sides, is that actually still the same building uh, which you've seen before. So I'm looking at the prob problematic of decomposing the scene or grouping and aggregating too many elements into units of interaction which work together, function together, and therefore should be perceived as figures. It's a kind of problem of architecture. And you see where we're doing this very effectively, I think, in this project, and you need artistic repertoire and the relentless formalism to deliver this. You see the kind of suburban condition in Strasbourg, and you imagine you're placing a two car parks on two sides of the road, a tram station, a bus station, into a kind of suburban environment. It could totally disappear into this kind of disfigured suburbia, and, and the way we use now artistic means, this kind of formalism to tie things together and using graphic strategies, cur curvature, continuity, and bringing all the technical elements, whether it's the demarcations of the line, the tarmac, the lampposts, under some kind of ruthless formalism to create a, a rigid language, everything works perfectly. These demarcations are perfect, the surfaces are perfect, the lights do their job, but they are all assimilated to each other, so they, they, they work together and create one unified move trajectory which leads you from the car park across the road into the uh, uh, tram station and the, and the uh, light posts become columns, the light dem demarcations become um, um, uh, light, light figures, light slots, and uh, you, you get something quite graphic. So you, you bring things into some kind of graphic repertoire that works also at night. And you can see also the way we articulate uh, the, the, the tram comes in and cuts into the roof, the buses swing around and cut from the other side, Everything is, can be traced, and everything is uh, brought under this graphic black, white, gray, concrete uh, uh, system of formalism. So that's what I mean when I talk about the high performance c communicative capacity of a compositional stance of treating the elements of architecture as a language while they're, of course, at the same time delivering all the pragmatic aspects we want to rely on and uh, want to see guaranteed. So the maximum of the compositional stance is bring all technically required elements under a relentless formalism. And again, that's what Rietfeld did in the House Schröder. And accidentally, even the, that pipe, that rain pipe, which is kind of something accidental, is kind of absorbed into this and doesn't become a, a, a disturbance. So for me, this is also, in the end, an attempt to suppress some of the necessary elements you bring them in to indicate their purpose, and if they're not part of an everyday purpose, you suppress them somehow. But you see, that's what we're doing. We, we, we focus on the essential space, and we let the light, for instance, trace and guide us through the space. And when it comes to a staircase, that's not another element plugged in, but it's the same formalism which drives the, the surface of the space, the light, the staircase, they all unify and tell the same story of, a gen of the trajectory of the space and calm things down. The same here where the, the seating areas, the, the acoustic ribbons, the lighting, the staircase is brought under that relentless and ruthless formalism to deliver something. The formal affiliation between louvers and staircases, we can play that game so they all become one, a one pellet and um, you let these things ripple through the louvers, uh, feed into the light, and you, from the inside, you remember f the outside where you've been, it guides you through, and every element oops, this, yeah, is, is playing a double role. It's playing a pragmatic role, bringing a certain lux level, but it's playing an articulatory role, guiding and, and presenting uh, where to go, where to move, what, to, what is happening where. And, uh, there's beauty as well 
in this because this kind of integrated coherence makes us feel good because the scene is legible, it's easy to navigate, we know where we're moving and we're not confronted with some kind of rubbish spill or backyard chaos which you get when a designer is absent and you're just purely hatching together some kind of backyard pragmatic uh, engineered kind of element where you just pick the best handrail, the light, uh, anything purely on technical pragmatics without a compositional clearing and, and, and articulation, you, you, you get a menace, you get a menace, which is actually also dysfunctional in a sense uh, for, for, because this is only for people who usually go there every day and know where everything is. So you can see also the affiliation the rippling delivers balconies, delivers lighting edges, uh, and the, the, the acoustic pattern is part of the same logic like the lighting pattern. So I call it the graphic approach. And you can play interesting games, this is Michael Graves. You can reassociate elements and create units of interaction that belong that, 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 that uh, additional shed grabs part of the um, original house and creates a kind of modernist house embedded and overlaid in a kind of traditional house. And there's a few other interesting games of associating things visually through alignment, through similitude of coloration, through contrast, you pull things apart through uh, uh, making similar, you draw things together. And there's an interesting game of overlap and the way this draw is set into a figure which is uh, then repeated in the... This is more playful. And we're doing this too. So we, we did these kind of graphic spaces, uh, very, very uh, drastic and expressed. And you see there's not only graphic elements, there's a painting participating, there's a table participating, there's a coloration of floor participating. And you can make these flocks and groups and, and have two systems interlocking and they play together. Very, very simple means and that's what I call uh, the compositional stance, the designer stance which is a very, very different mindset from the engineering stance. Of course, engineering-wise, everything is a function too. So the semiologic project, I call it, it's, it's kind of a language, a system of signification. This is the project in Vienna where we're distinguishing, for instance, the library system and the central student services just through a simple color coding and volumetric separation, but we also wanted them interweave and come close to each other, but always be distinguishable. So you will have the two colors, and we have also different facade types, office types, that recess bit is all the public zones. Um, and when you come in, you, you can find the, 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 the light trajectories you found on the outside guiding you through on the inside. There's an overall tilt and dynamism which always points you to the entrance, so the kind of navigation aids. So when it comes to communication, it's communicating the designations of spaces, but also it's communicating what belongs together. It also communicates how to navigate, what to follow through. It is an orientation and navigation. And when we did the facades here of the, of the Milan project, what we did here is that we have this block. It's quite varied. And on the outside, we started with a full-on metal facade. And as you come to the inside, where it becomes more domestic, we started to introduce the timber. And we gradually increased the gradient of timber and it becomes more austere to the outside. So the outside face and inside face are differentiated and flowing into each other. So these, this is also doing urban orientation work. Facade doing urban articulation work, if you like. Uh, similarly, when we went to, you saw the Strasbourg, the way we treated the banality of a car park and made it a kind of thrusting force, a guiding trajectory, something articulate. We did this for BMW Central Building where we, we, we did something quite drastic with a car park, but also these huge car could be disorienting. So they also, all the alignment of the cars guide you to the central point and they loop you through, but the formalism continues inside the building. And the facade, in a way, is a, is a representation in a way, or follows the same logic of these trajectories which run into each other, overlap and intersect, which is everything to do with the different trajectories of materials, people moving and streaming through this building and intersecting in the central building. That's expressed through everything we do in the building. So you can see 
the diagonals, the different materials, trajectories coming through, and everything, whether it's conveyor belts, trusses, pipes, lighting, are brought under that relentless formalism again to not become a kind of distract and clutter, but guide you through and orient you. And uh, the way we, we detail a handrail is another beam, as another um, uh, uh, rip and edge beam and uh, steel truss, they're all brought to play this game of pulling us through the building. <clears throat> yeah, again, I recommend that strategy. And uh, this is my first building. It was, I started this when I was a young student at Zahas. I came in uh, nearly 30 years ago. And it was finished about 25 years ago. And here you also have, of course, a very, very coherent, strong, strong image. There's some um, interesting points. I want to point out that the, the, the volumes intersection is articulated in the detail. You can see where the volume sticks out and then the, it tr is traced through with a cut, with a lighting cut, that you see the volume hovering above. You can see it there. So you see it coming in. So there's, there's this kind of making clear, making the composition transparent.